Hi, I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. I'm here with doctors Lenny Calabrese and Cassie Calabrese coming to us live from the Cleveland Clinic. We asked Len and Cassie to come on and talk about issues surrounding COVID. Good morning, folks. Hey, Jack. Good morning. Good morning. So um, tell us what's going on at the Cleveland Clinic. How has the uh, COVID-19 changed the rheumatology world there? Uh, it is, of course, heavily impacted uh, all of the Cleveland Clinic, um, but especially the rheumatology department, given our, our patient population. Um, lots of worry on our patients' end, um, and then also on our end to keep them safe. We've really moved away from in-person patient visits, which I know a lot of our peer institutions have done as well, um, really discouraging any face-to-face -face visits that are not essential, including new patients. Um, we do encourage our patients to keep their in scheduled infusions um, with the thought that if they miss their infusions, run the risk of disease flare, which would require high doses of prednisone, more exposure to the clinic and even hospitalization. So trying to limit face-to-face -face contact and also see the right person and patient um, in face-to-face -face visit. Um, as we are able. So we've lived through, you know, other um, almost epidemics, you know, uh, with um, MERS, SARS, and then, you know, there's a lot written the last few years about Zika and chicken gun. You know, what have we learned from um, those infections that might apply to this story? Huh, that's a... It's a, it's a good question, Jack. I think it would be Karnak to answer that right now. Um, you know, I think that this is unprecedented and uh, the, the, the speed uh, and uh, gravity of this uh, on balance uh, has made this, you know, heretofore a, 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 a unique situation. Not as gravid as some of these other infections, but the uh, spreadability of this and the global reach of this, I, I think we're going to be in this situation for a long time. And I, I'm just echoing a lot of what the epi people are talking about. So uh, I, I'm, we're, we're dug in. Yeah. So uh, Cassie, you want to address why um, we're being deluged with Plaquenil requests and information? And is there a real utility to using it? And then Len, maybe to follow it up and say, maybe Plaquenil isn't all it's cracked up to be by what you know. So Cassie, why don't you start? Sure, we certainly are being deluged um, after a couple, um, you know, there's a little bit of data, everyone's focusing on this one paper um, out of Marseille, I think it was, that included 26 COVID positive patients. Um, and so small study, um, lots of limitations, um, which we won't get into, but they showed some benefit in decreasing um, viral load um, in these COVID positive patients. Um, and this was a study looking at the use of Plaquenil and Azithromycin. Again, lots of limitations, like six of their patients dropped out, three of them because they died from COVID. Um, so there's been all this buzz about Plaquenil, which we do use for other intracellular infections infections. So um, we appreciate the thought um, that it may be uh, useful in COVID positive patients who have, you know, mild or, or more than mild symptoms. Um, but we, we just don't know and, and we, you know, need more studies. So it has been included in, in treatment protocols at a lot of institutions that I've seen and including ours um, at a dose of 800 milligrams on day one. Um, after diagnosis, followed by four days of 400 milligrams. Um, this has been misconstrued by a lot of patients that they should be on it prophylactically um, and have just an outpouring of patients requesting Plaquenil. And we just don't know um, the safety in the setting of this infection, which we can talk about a lot of the mortality and morbidity is from this, you know, cytokine storm or pro-inflammatory pro state or immune response from the infection and the timing of when to, to give a, you know, something like a steroid sparing agent, we're still just not sure. You know, I'd like to add to this um, some granularity about this infection. Um, you know, I think that many people are thinking of this like it's some type of bacterial infection. And in actuality, it's a very complex 
viral infection and it has its own modeling. So early on, this is uh, a, a, you know, a new virus for which we have no uh, immunologic memory for. And that as the virus takes hold and people develop their clinical illness, whether it be subclinical or clinical, um, there is activation of innate immunity and then a very rapid generation of adaptive response. And uh, by the end of this infection, people have antibodies and the virus is actually very hard to detect uh, um, uh, at the end of the clinical illness. So there is an ebb and flow here. Where drugs like Plaquenil, uh, I have no idea about azithromycin, uh, antivirals, anti-IL-6, which we'll talk about in a minute, has a lot to do with this timing. So Plaquenil has been used in a lot of other viral infections uh, uh, experimentally. And probably the most alarming model is a, uh, a non-human primate model of chikungunya, uh, where uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, was uh, given to these animals. They were exposed to chikungunya. And out of the box, animals on Plaquenil had higher viral loads than the animals not on Plaquenil. Um, as they followed over time, and now we blend this in with clinical data from using um, uh, animal aerials in patients with chikungunya, um, there was no viral relapse. Um, and there was a tendency when used later on in the course of the infection to have lower acute phase reactants. So the actual question of timing here is critical. Maybe it will be a good thing to use it uh, once infection has taken hold and people have a clinical illness. Maybe it could be dangerous to our patients who are already on Plaquenil. I mean, we don't know that, um, but it, you know, it remains, you know, we have to have some equipoise to, to answer this. Um, maybe an antiviral followed by Plaquenil may be the right role. So, I'm just, at, you know, I'm answer, asking questions, and I'm very heartened to see the uh, uh, European COVID uh, uh, consortium uh, are launching a very robust, uh, uh, almost a thousand patient Plaquenil study that should be rolling and have data within a month. So these are the types of questions that we have to ask. You know, where are you in the infection? What is the intervention? And, and what do we do? The final thing I'll mention is when people die of COVID, they're not dying of infection. In fact, the virus is almost non-detectable in most of these people it's been looked at. They die of damage. And so we have to structure therapies to, to treat those most vulnerable people as well. So you had mentioned earlier about the cytokine storm that might ensue as a result of infection there. Um, at some point, you hit a threshold where there is a sort of massive release of cytokines, including IL-6. So you want to explain the role of IL-6 and why we're going after that with uh, trials? Um, both yeah, I, and I, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, uh, I, you have to be careful what words you use here. You know, I don't want to say enthusiastic. I'm, you know, very interested in this area. I think it's very logical. Um, if we think of the model that you have infection, innate triggering, develop of adaptive immunity, 80% of people do good, this other 20% not so good. Um, in that group where there's progression to ARDS and uh, intense tissue damage, what we know of the immunopathology is, is that there are a lot of monocytes, there are a lot of polymorphonuclear leukocytes, the few immunopathologic studies that have looked at detailed peripheral flow over time um, have shown an increase in population of activated monocytes, CD14, CD16 positive, an unusual and inflammatory subset that are cranking out, in particular, a lot of IL-6 and a lot of GM-CSF. Um, and, uh, you know, based upon this type of modeling, you know, uh, this you know, we, we don't really have a definition for cytokine storm per se. We know it when we see it, but you know, what the, 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 the signature is, is uh, still remains to be seen. But in that population, I think that there's a very, very strong rationale for interdicting. IL-6 has been the first drug out of the box and some interesting anecdotes. 
The question is timing. And, and I think that my concern is from several of the protocols that I've seen so far um, at other institutions, they're waiting too late. Mechanical ventilation, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, macrophage activation, multi-system organ damage, as opposed to patients who have declared themselves um, uh, hospitalized and now are starting to desat before mechanical ventilation. I, I think that's the ideal time to intervene. And I will tell you that from what I understand of both the Genentech and the Regeneron trials, that's exactly the type of um, uh, patients that will be recruited for these. So what I'm taking uh, from this discussion is that timing is really crucial to some of these treatment issues. Cassie, let's close with what other treatments are being advocated, what's hard to get, what's easy to get, what, what should our docs know about? Uh, that's a good question and things are really evolving in, in real time and the treatment protocol that we have developed here at the Cleveland Clinic has changed probably about 20 times since Thursday. Um, initially, they were giving um, inpatients Kaletra, um, which is a, a combination protease inhibitor um, used in HIV, which we ran out of and now we think it probably doesn't matter because there was a, a negative study published on Friday for the use of that um, antiretroviral protease inhibitor um, so that was on our protocol. I don't know if it will be coming off probably. Um, along with Plaquenil, um, we're still looking for the right place to put IL-6 inhibitors on our treatment protocol, um, but something else that has been uh, much talked about is remdesivir, which is a kind of broad spectrum antiviral that was looked at during the Ebola um, outbreak. And that has shown possibly some promise in these um, coronaviruses. So we are, I think we have maybe gave it to one patient last week um, that we're working on um, having that in our protocol as well, remdesivir. Um, I if I had to else. think of this uh, in sequence, you know, if, if we had uh, an effective antiviral and remdesivir is IV, so it's not an oral therapy, you can't just go take it right out of the bat, you're already a hospitalized patient. Antiviral early, you know, perhaps um, um, hydroxychloroquine um, it, at that same phase, because it's, you know, not a blistering um, uh, anti-inflammatory drug. And then vigilance uh, for patients who are the one in five who will deteriorate and then um, intervention with IL-6. Um, both the Regeneron and Genentech uh, trials are uh, RCTs with a placebo limb, uh, two to one randomization active drug to placebo. And hopefully, uh, and unfortunately, because the, 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 the tempo of this illness is gonna go quickly right now over the next six weeks, we should know something pretty quick. Okay. Folks, thank you very much for your leadership and, and knowledge. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll stay tuned. Yeah. Thank Talk you. Talk to you again, Jack. Be thanks. safe. All right, guys. Thanks a bunch. We're not.